Hi, this is Mike from Mike's Unboxing Reviews and How To, and on today's video, we'll be taking a BIOS tour of the MSI B550M Pro VDH Wi Fi. Keep watching to find out more. Okay, so in today's video, we'll be taking a look at the MicroStar or MSI B550M Pro VDH Wi Fi. Taking a look at the BIOS, looking at some of the features, and just basically having a walkthrough of the BIOS. So this could be a long one, so grab yourself a cup of tea and a bite to eat, and we'll hit straight into it. Okay, so this is the MSI Click BIOS 5. Uh, today's time and date, top left-hand corner, CPU speed, DDR speeds, etc. These are the top ones that you're probably most likely to want. This is the Creator Genie, so that is basically turning precision boost overclocking on or off. Uh, currently it is turned off, so click on it, and so it stays illuminated, and it will stay on. These are your XMP profiles for your RAM, two profiles which are normally available. Uh, we'll take a look at those a little bit closer detail when we go into the advanced mode or memory mode. Over here we've got the option to change to advanced. So you click on that to change to advanced mode. Click again, goes into standard mode. F12, the screenshots. This icon here is for search, so if there's a term you're looking for and you can't find it, you can just type it in there and it will try and find it for you. Language there, so you can change the languages. And we're in English, so we'll stay with that. And X at the top is to exit out of BIOS. Also, it will give you the option to save the BIOS when you do so. So this section, you've got your temperatures, etc., and your BIOS revisions, and also processor type, etc., etc. Boot priority is also something that most people will probably be looking for at some point. So if you're doing a boot override or something, or you need to change those, you can just drag and drop those, just left click, hold it, and move it along, etc. Usual kind of thing. If you want to boot from the network, just slide that one along to the very end and that will boot from network. But we want to choose this one here, so that's the UFI hard drive, so we'll leave that as is. So left-hand side, we've got options for CPU, memory, storage, fan info, help. And at the bottom there, M flash, which is enter the flashing bars. Favorites, hardware monitor, so you can go into basically the fans system, all that kind of stuff. CPU fan control, ERP ready, which is power saving mode, and HD audio controller, so you can choose to have that enabled or disabled. So that is enabled. ERP, click on it and you can enable it and then you can toggle those buttons across just clicking on them. Uh, CPU fan warning, so if the fan stops for some reason, so you really want to have that on. CSM UFI BIOS mode, so you can change it for compatibility mode or UEFI. So if you've got older drives or older system, then you can choose CSM. Or if you're moving from a drive, maybe from an older Windows 7 installation, something like that, then you can use that. AHCI or RAID gives you the option to enable the RAID for your SATA headers and easy LED control basically turns your RGB on or off so you can choose if you want to keep all your RGB off full the time then click on that if you want it on or enabled then have it like that so CPU mode again CPU frequency base clocks core ratios etc number of threads number of processors and instruction sets supported into memory gives you your current DRAM frequency speed so we're currently at 3000 on our Corsair sticks and their XMP profiles are 3000 for both Profile 1 and Profile 2 with the same CAS latencies. Also tells you which slots are detecting RAM, so if you're having issues with RAM not recognized, like you're only showing 8 gigs and you've got 16 installed, then check on here to make sure it's actually physically recognized in the BIOS. Next up we've got storage, so currently it says we're in AHCI mode, so again obviously if we change that into RAID, that would change on a reboot. So you can set up your RAID devices, etc. It tells you which devices are present on your SATA ports. Again, if you've got hard drive not being recognized, make sure that it's physically recognized in the BIOS. We've only got one drive installed, which is our silicon power, one terabyte drive. Pretty straightforward stuff there. Fan information, so this gives you your fan speeds and custom settings if you've enabled any. I've already gone ahead and set some custom curves. If you want to get into these in more detail, click on the cogwheel, and that will open up the hardware monitor. And we'll go through this later in the advanced section. Next up is the help. So you can go on there and it tells you basically what all the keys do. Really handy. Probably one to remember is F10, save and reset. That's quite a useful one. But essentially most of it is just up, down, left, right with the keys. Using enter to select, escape to exit, and all those kinds of things. Moving down to M flash, click on there and it will go into the BOSS flashing mode. We won't be doing this in this video. Uh, there is an upcoming video where we will be flashing the BOSS on this. So if you want to see how that goes, uh, click on the links in the video description. Next up is favorites. Again, 
no idea really why this is in there, but it's, it's there if you want to use it. Hardware monitor, uh, as we looked at just now, so you click on that, it goes into the fan control and all that kind of stuff, temperature controls, and this is good for setting up RPMs for fans or auto or DC control, all that kind of usual stuff. So that is the, uh, the basic BIOS, pretty much most things are covered there. We go to advanced, so now we've got the same settings at the top, and we go into settings here, so it's a little bit more advanced, so we've got system status, this gives you time dates, etc., and physical connected drives. Also, your DMI information for the motherboard. Press escape to get out of there, and escape again to go back a level. So that is system status. In advance, we've got a whole ton of options here. So PCI Express sub settings. So this is for setting your PCI Express generation. So if you've got maybe a Gen 4 card or a Gen 3 card, and you're having issues with maybe a expansion cable, so if you've got a vertically mounted GPU or horizontally mounted GPU on a cable, then you may need to change your gen switch to gen 3 from gen 4. Just click on it to change it. So above 4G memory for crypto mining, etc. You can enable or disable. Again, the PCI Express generations, you can change the lanes and configurations. So generally you're best leaving it as auto unless you've got specific devices which are requiring some other kind of uh, setup or configuration. Next one is ACPI, so this is your power settings. So we've got power LED, you can set to blinking when it's in sleep mode, or you can have it dual color. And also you've got an option for CPU over temperature alert. You can have that enabled, disabled, or auto. Integrated peripherals, so we've got our onboard LAN. Obviously this particular processor is a Ryzen 3 3100, so there's no uh, onboard graphics. So we've got nothing in there for graphics, but certainly we've got things like VGA card detection. You can set to auto or ignore. Also, onboard LAN controller, you can enable or disable if you wanted to. Onboard boot ROM, enabled or disabled. Network stack, again, enabled or disabled. Onboard Wi-Fi control, this is the one which most of you will probably be uh, more interested in. So you can either turn off or turn on the onboard Wi-Fi and Bluetooth module. You can go into that a little bit more detail later on, I believe, but uh, we'll check that for later. SATA configurations, so again, you can choose to have hot plug for SATA drives. Generally, SATA hot plug in Windows is not a particularly good idea, so uh, I would leave those as disabled. Also, SATA mode AACI is the one which is preferable. You can change again to RAID if you want to set up a RAID, but I think most people these days would go with AACI, which is your regular Windows installation kind of setup. Next up, audio configuration. So your HD audio, so enabled or disabled. Click on that one to choose enabled or disabled. If you're using a separate USB DAC or a separate sound card, then it's a, a good idea to set that as disabled so they don't conflict in Windows. Next up, USB configuration. So uh, AHCI handoff and legacy USB support. You're probably best off having both of those enabled. There's no real downside of having them enabled. If you have them disabled, then certain uh, older operating systems or other devices which are USB supported on version three may not work on version two and vice versa. So that is uh, definitely worth taking a look at. Enhanced mouse pointer speed, that is for changing the settings from one to 20. In the BIOS, it doesn't affect anything else, so uh, it just basically speeds it up to uncontrollable levels, so I would leave that as level one. Super IO configurations, so this is basically for your COM port, which if you've got one enabled or connected to the ports, then you can enable or disable it, and also you can go in and change the IRQs and all that kind of stuff for the serial ports, which for some older serial devices, they do require specific IRQs and all that kind of stuff for the interrupts. So, yeah, so you can do all that there. I'm actually going to disable the port. It's one less thing we have to worry about. Next up, power management setup. So we've got ERP ready. So if your business or um, state or whatever requires your system to be ERP ready for power management, you can choose that to have enabled or disabled. Generally, if you choose ERP as being disabled, you may find a slight increase in performance due to the, uh, the less restricted power management. So maybe worth leaving that on or off again. You can try it with and without and see which works best for you. Restore AC power loss. So if you have a power cut and your power goes off, do you want the PC to turn back on? If you've set this up as some sort of server, then yes, you probably want to choose it to uh, power on or choose last state, so if the PC was off, it won't come on anyway. If it was on, it will try and reboot. You get the general idea. Power off generally might be the better option. Um, if your PC's off and you don't, you, you're just using it as a normal PC, then yeah, leave that as power off so it doesn't power itself on after a power cut. 
system powerful protection you can choose to have that enabled or disabled uh, basically if there's any kind of abnormal voltage maybe a cheaper power supply or through some kind of surge brick which is failing then you can have that enabled or disabled generally for most people in the uk um, i would say system powerful protection is probably not necessary but certainly for other parts of the world where you may have slightly less uh, good or reliable power supplies then it might be worth leaving that as enabled next up windows os configuration so again you've got your uh, option for csm or compatibility mode depending if you're using an older version of windows which i probably wouldn't recommend on this particular board because most of the features are kind of tailored towards windows 10 so i would leave that as is uh, gop information would be for the graphics card which is installed so that'll give you some idea of what processor and which version it is etc so ours is a, a very humble gp108 which is the nvidia gt 1030 and it's using the nvidia gpu uefi driver uh, secure boot again you can choose settings in there to secure boot for certain operating systems or if you've got a custom configuration you can use that most people best off leave that as disabled and uh, yeah just leave it as it is wake up event setup so you can choose to wake up the system by bios or from operating system most of this you can leave as it is just leave it as standard and windows will take care of all that kind of stuff if you change stuff in bios you may need to reconfigure windows so you're better off leaving this well alone if possible secure erase plus so there you can choose to erase a ssd um, if you wanted to erase that so we're going to choose no and you've got basically a self-test for nvme so you can go in and test a drive if it's supporting i think it's the 1.4 standards generally your drive should appear there and you can do a self-test on it uh, next one's amd overclocking this is what most of you will be looking at so first time you go into it it'll give you a warning about damage etc if you're happy to do that then you can go in and change the settings so manual cpu overclocking you've got options to change the frequency voltage and core count control you can change the core counts uh, yeah generally kind of usual overclocking type settings there ddr and infinity fabric timing so you can change those uh, frequency so you've got timing configuration for the memory overclocking etc the dram controller pretty advanced stuff uh, if you're not too sure what you're doing i would suggest leaving well alone and using something like ryzen master to do all these kinds of things uh, so you've got your infinity fabric frequency and dividers you can set those to auto or you can have offsets to various different configurations of megahertz generally speaking um, ryzen 3 processors have an infinity fabric kind of uh, sweet spot around about 1800 megahertz but again i would probably leave this on auto unless you know exactly what you're doing or exactly what your system is capable of so that is it for those sessions so you've got eco mode uh yeah you probably want to disable that if you're going to do any overclocking otherwise there will be some kind of uh, restrictions power wise precision boost overdrive we've got it enabled currently which was done by clicking on the creator genie cpu section here if you turn that off and then go back into settings and advanced and then down to amd overclocking and back into precision boost overdrive we see now set to auto so it wasn't specifically enabled so if you go into auto you can choose disable enabled or advanced in advanced you've got then precision boost overclocking limits so you can set those to auto or you can uh, choose whether it's kind of chosen by your motherboard settings or you can choose manual settings if you know what you're doing you can put your ppt tdc and edc limits in there so if you know those limits of the motherboard or what you think it can do then certainly you can go ahead and change those i would probably leave that as again auto and try and do most of this from within ryzen master also you've got your precision boost overdrive scaler so you can choose manual on there so you can choose 1x up to 10x and you've got your limits for megahertz of precision boost overclock so you can override the default limits again you're probably best off leaving those uh set to standard unless you know what you're doing and also you've got your pr platform thermal throttle limit again auto or manual so you can set your limit in there for what the actual limit is as in the processor degrees celsius so again um, i'm going to leave that set to auto and we'll leave that as it is uh, actually no we'll leave that as it is so next one is ln2 mode so this basically uh, offers a little bit of extra boost to the system if you're doing extreme overclocking with ln2 
Again, most people, apart from probably Jay's Two Cents and Gamers Nexus, are about the only people who are probably going to need that, and possibly someone like Kingpin. But if you're not one of those three, then I would suggest leaving that well alone or set it to auto. Next up is the SOC voltage, and you can choose that specifically. Uncore OC mode, you can choose that individually as well. So enabled or disabled. VDDP voltage control, so you can choose that whether it's auto or manual, and you can set the limits there. So that's auto. Uh, VDDG voltage control, again, if you're not too sure what you're doing, you're best off leaving these things well alone. And next one is NUMA modes per socket, so you can go and choose that automatically between zero and four. That's gonna depend mostly on your processor. You can leave that as manual. Most of this stuff, definitely worth doing in Ryzen Master. It is a much, much more flexible way of doing it. And also is a little bit more kind of, not idiot proof, that's the wrong word, but it certainly is a, a nicer interface and use this very common language. And also with Ryzen Master, there's a lot of people who do overclocking online, so you can check out their videos and then try and emulate some of their settings rather than trying to blindly go through it yourself. So next up is boot. So we've got our boot options. So boot configuration, uh, you can choose to have your full screen logo display on or off, enabled or disabled, uh, numlock state on or off. Again, if you're using a 10 keyless keyboard or a keyboard which has a um, smaller form factor but also incorporates number keys as a secondary function on some other keys, you may want to leave this enabled or disabled. Uh, info block is basically for the graphical settings. I would leave that alone. Post beep. Some people may prefer to have that, so if you've got a BIOS speaker connected, you can listen to the post beeps to work out why your system isn't booting. Generally, this board's pretty good. It's got the BIOS LED, so you probably won't need that, but some people like to go a bit old school and have the post beep. Next up is your fixed boot order priorities. So we've got our UFI set as one. If you click on those, you can choose which one and then move it to the top, etc., or swap the places around. So go into one. As you can see, now I've changed it, so... Let's choose boot manager, because that's the one we want to boot from, and that's now become boot option number one. If you've got more than one hard drive, then you may wish to change that. So in your BBS, you can choose it, um, or you can disable it. Again, Windows boot manager is probably the one you're gonna want. Next up, security. So you can set an admin password for the motherboard. Uh, yeah, for the motherboard. I was thinking BIOS then, but yeah, motherboard BIOS, same sort of thing. Trusted computing, so if you've got a trusted computing platform module, you can enable all your settings in there and chassis intrusion. There is actually a header on the motherboard, so if someone opens up the case, um, you can be notified of that or it'll prevent booting, all that kind of stuff. And last one up in the settings section is save and exit. So you click on that and then you can choose to save your settings and exit or discard settings and exit also. So next up is uh, OC, which is basically a kind of enhanced version of what we were looking at earlier. So you go OC explore, you can have expert or normal and you've got things like your CPU ratio mode, CPU ratios, auto. I mean, I would leave all this as auto unless you really know what you're doing. You've got your advanced CPU configurations. So you've got AMD overclocking, which is basically where we were before kind of. So you can choose your precision boost, whether you have various different modes. Again, Windows Ryzen master software is much, much easier to use than this at all. So you've got CPU core control, uh, SMT control, LN2 mode 2 again for stability in those really cold temperatures. Uh, AMD CBS, so with the common options there, so you've got performance boost, global C state power controls, idle supply, idle control, all that kind of stuff. And yeah, all the usual kind of stuff there. Again, if you don't know what you're doing, best off leaving it well alone. Uh, SVM, so that is the virtual machine kind of mode, so enable or disable virtualization. If you're going to be using some form of virtualization, so uh, maybe things like docker or vmware that kind of stuff you'll need that to be enabled if you're not using those things then to be honest with you, you're probably left best off just leaving it disabled nx mode uh, that's the non-execute disable or enable so best off leaving that enabled and pss support is for acpi objects performance regulator uh, you can choose if you're doing specific types of testing then you can regulate performance so there's benefits in Cinebench, that kind of stuff. These are a little bit outdated now. I guess if you're an overclocker, LN2 mode would probably be the one you'd be looking for, or maybe a Geekbench, that sort of thing, but uh, generally I'd say leave that disabled for general Windows use. 
uh, spread spectrum. So if you're having issues with electromagnetic interference, then you can modify the settings there. So enable, disable, or auto. Generally, auto is absolutely fine. And for the CPU, the SOC current optimization, again, you can choose a custom setting if you want to, change your uh, full scale telemetry, full scale, all that kind of stuff. Again, if you're not too sure, set it to auto, it's a lot safer. Next up, we've got our F clock base clock. So if you want to overclock the actual uh, F clock or B clock, whichever you want to call it, then you can put in a manual setting there. Again, Ryzen Master does a much better job of doing this. Next up, our DRAM settings. So you've got the option for Profile 1 and Profile 2, which effectively just replicates what we've got here in this top corner. So uh, choose whichever one suits. Some RAM modules will have two different profiles down in this profile section. So Profile 1 may be kind of like DDR4-3000, and then the next one may be DDR4-3200 with slightly different CAS ratings, maybe uh, one CL level up. So that may be 3015, that may be 32000 with 16, so slightly higher frequency, but slower CAS rating. Again, if you're not too sure, just uh, choose the XMP profile that best suits your processor. If you're using older processors, try and use a lower XMP setting. Newer processors, obviously, you can take it up pretty much as high as you want to. Next up, uh, F-clock frequency. Again, auto, you can change your individual settings there to whichever suits your system. Again, sweet spot is kind of around about 1800, but again, it's going to depend mostly on your processor. So you've got your U-clock divides, again, memory overclocking, that sort of stuff, memory try it. So uh, basically this will try different types of memory speeds and it will basically try and overclock the system. It's, uh, again, I'd rather do this in Ryzen Master. I've said that once or twice. Do take heed, it does make a lot of sense. Uh, memory failure retry. So if a specific speed doesn't work, then you can go in and it will choose another speed and keep on going basically. How many retries you can choose to have enabled or disabled. If you have disabled, it will basically fail and that is it, you'll have to reset the BIOS. So having retry is worth doing. And the retry count, you can set to as many as you want. Generally uh, two is fine. That is what the default is. Memory fast boot, so that is the fast boot function. So you, again, you can choose to have that enabled or disabled. Then you've got advanced DRAM configurations. So if you know the exact latencies or timings for your RAM, so if you want to overclock it to a very, very high level and you know the individual settings, you can do all that in there. And then you've got digital power. So that is your load line calibrations, all that kind of stuff. So again, very um, advanced stuff. If you're not too sure, leave it all to auto. So that is, uh, yeah, I think that is pretty much it in there. Uh, memory Z basically just reads the SPD information from the RAM sticks. So if you wanted to, you could uh, take a snapshot of that and manually put those settings in just in case for some reason your XMP doesn't work as it should do. So that is, uh, yes, oh, CPU specification didn't do that one. So it basically tells you the processor and memory change detect. I would always leave that as enabled because if for some reason you do something with your RAM, move a stick or change memory, it won't automatically kind of go into the, the failover safe mode. So with this, you want it to detect that the memory has changed. And then when your system boots up the next time, it will go into the BIOS first of all, to allow you to make any changes you need to. Next up, SEM flash. So that is the M flash system. Again, we won't be doing that in this video. That'll be done in a follow-up video, but that is basically to flash the BIOS in the basically from the BIOS mode using a USB stick. So on the other side, we've got our OC profile. So if you set up a profile, you can either load them, save them, etc. You can select six different profiles, whichever one works best for you. Or if you've got different types of hardware, maybe you can have overclocking profile one for a certain type of RAM, overclocking profile two for a different make of RAM or different set of RAM, those kinds of things, just to save you having to write down all the settings. You can save those in the profiles. Hardware monitor is uh, pretty much where most of you are going to end up going. So this is where you set up your fan speeds. If you've got a uh, regular CPU fan, you probably find you're best off just leaving it set to PWM and smart fan mode, and then you can uh, change all your speeds. Just drag and drop these to whichever you feel best. So if you want to have your CPU fan run at 30% as a minimum to start with, you can choose that. Or if you want to go into kind of a zero fan type mode, if the device supports it, then you can certainly do that and you can raise these or lower these to adjust the curve as necessary. For me personally, I do like to have things a little bit quieter, especially when filming. 
So I generally tend to have a, uh, a setup where it's kind of starts about 30% or so, up to about 45% up to get to kind of regular temperatures. And then as we start putting a bit of pressure on the CPU, it just ramps up and with our hottest part being 70 degrees, at 100%. So I never want my CPU to get to us to 70 if possible, but if it does, then the fan will be at 100% to try and rectify that. Also, you can choose whether it monitors the CPU core, the system, the MOSFETs, chipsets, CPU socket itself, or your PCI Express. So this is more beneficial when you go into other fans. Also, you've got PWM, DC, or auto. Sometimes auto is fine. I generally tend to choose the specific one. So if you've got a three pin fan connected, choose DC. If you've got a four pin fan, choose PWM, those kinds of things. You've got your temperature source again, which is basically replicating this and your step up and step down times. So that is the CPU fan. You've got pump fan. So again, you can choose smart fan mode, DC or PWM. And in this particular board, we've got a Colink Citadel case, which is running off three fans on a controller. So we've just got all the fans plugged into the controller and the controller is sending its RPM values to the motherboard, as you can see there. So we go into system fan three. So I've set this to PWM because it is a four pin connection. If I put it to DC, the fans just start spinning at 1300 and that is it. There's no real control. So you may find that on certain kinds of uh, controller, you might need to go in here and actually see which one makes a bit of difference. So smart fan mode is enabled. So with these fans, we're at 50% of the PWM range or DC voltage into it. So about six volts there at uh, 40 degrees or lower. And basically it's going to get to, actually let's change that. So to make it a little bit quieter, we'll say 30 degrees or 30% rather at around about zero to 50 degrees. Again, we've got that similar sort of ramp there. So I don't really want the system getting too hot or the CPU, so 60 degrees is uh, pretty warm and we never want to go over 70, so 100% there. Let's even that out a little bit. So there's a nice, uh, nice curve, so nice and quiet in normal use. But as soon as the processor starts getting over kind of 55, 54 degrees, then things are going to start ramping up. Again, you don't have to do it this way, do it however you want. If you want to, you can set all of them as 100%, it's entirely up to you, but this is just, I prefer a sort of a more uh, steep curve towards the end with a, a flattish curve in the lower temperatures, so to avoid that ramping up and ramping down. You can see how this affects in the timeline on the bottom, and also all of these settings will be reflected and updated in the Red Dragon software on this particular board, which also really does a good job of fan control. So yeah, you can choose on here as well, whether you're monitoring the CPU core, the socket, the MOSFETs, chipset, etc. Generally B550 boards, the actual chipset and the MOSFETs are pretty well regulated on these boards, especially this particular one. So I would say CPU core is absolutely fine. That's probably going to be your best bet. If your CPU is starting to get warm, things start getting out of hand pretty quickly. So that is your best bet. So that is the hardware monitor. Again, at the bottom, it's got other things that tells you what is going on. As you can see, we've got a pretty reasonable spread there. There's no particular hot spots, although the chipset at the moment is actually running the hottest. 39C, CPU socket is 32, PCI Express is at 30, system's 35, CPU core 35, so yeah, it's all in around the similar sort of region. There's no obvious hotspots. If you had one hotspot here, say for instance your MOS is set is like 50 when the rest are there, then maybe that's something you want to address with your fan placement, or perhaps choose that as your monitoring, so then it keeps things a little bit cooler and ramps the fans up a little bit quicker. Hopefully that explains it. Anyway, so that is the uh, the fan control and hardware monitor. If you want to, you can change all those. Again, all full speed will set all fans to 100%. Uh, Default will restore the system defaults from the factory. And set all cancel, no idea. Never used it, and I don't know what it is. Next one is the board explorer, which basically just tells you where things are and what is installed. So as you look around the board, shows you various things so there is your IO section there's your M.2 and it tells you what is installed in that bottom left hand corner if you roll over the processor socket it tells you what's installed and also tells you your mount and it also tells you your memory all very exciting stuff so those are the main points and also again it does point out some of the individual bits of the board so system fan connector 3 serial port connectors all that kind of stuff so there's an expansion port for USB 2's 
yeah, you get the general idea. Pretty boring. If you've uh, stick with us this long, well done. I congratulate you. So that is uh, pretty much it. There's not really much more we can show you in the board. When it comes to overclocking, again, definitely you can use Ryzen Master. It is far, far simpler and uh, a little bit more forgiving should things go wrong because obviously it invokes after Windows is loaded rather than before. So yeah, it does, does give you a little bit of time to change anything rather than having to go and reset the bar every time if you do something which the system doesn't like. So I'm going to enable Creator Genie again and I'm going to leave my XMP profiles on. I'm going to save and exit and uh, I think that's pretty much it. Okay, so there you go. There has been a BIOS tour of the MSI B550M Pro VDH Wi-Fi. What a crazy name. Uh, hopefully the video has been useful to you. If it has, don't forget to give the video a like and subscribe if you like content of this in your inbox daily. Um, like I said before, a lot of the stuff in there is probably best done via the AMD Ryzen Master software. Although things like adding your XMP profile, enabling precision boost overclocking, changing your boot order, maybe enabling or disabling the RGB is very, very useful to do straight from the BOSS. And uh, yeah, it is very easy to do. The BOSS version of this at the moment, as of today's recording date, which is the 15th of the 2nd, 2021, is one behind. So the current version or the latest version, which is still in beta, unfortunately, uh, basically adds a resizable bar feature for Radeon 6000 series graphics cards, which basically no one's got, so uh, I'm not worried too much about that. But certainly if you want to see an update to this video, if uh, you're watching this further in the future, then do let us know in the comment section below and we'll try and make it happen. But I think that's going to wrap it up. I've been Mike, this is Mike's Unboxing Reviews and How To, and uh, I've got a processor to fix. Thanks for watching.